Um, I have a confession to make. Um, as I've been talking with many of the persons here at this camp meeting, I um, have come to the conclusion that they know a lot. A lot of biblical truth. I mean a lot, a lot more than most persons know. And you know, um, that puts pressure on a young <laughs> boy like myself to come up here and to speak to such people because the thought goes through your mind, what could you possibly tell these people that they have not already heard or that they don't already know? How can you feed persons with such developed appetites? So, you know, it was kind of troubling, but the Lord, um, he spoke to my heart and told me that he fed Israel with the same food every day. Manna, manna, manna. So even if what I have to say today, you already know, or you already heard, it is still the word of the Lord. Alright? You know, the Apostle Paul always said, for me to write that which you already know, is not burdensome. But for you, it is safe. So having said that, I'm going to talk about a topic. I, I don't know if it, um, anyone has ever named a sermon such, but I'd like to name this presentation God's Mystery. God's Mystery. All right? Um, and we'll begin in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Romans chapter 16, verses 20. 5 to 27. Romans, I said 15 or 16? Right, Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. And it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for obedience to the faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever amen in verse 25 we learn something the word of God says that there, is, that there is a mystery, or was a mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest. Also turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Here something similar is recorded. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 26, the Apostle Paul is, well in verse 25 he speaks of the fact that God made him a minister. And he says in verse 25, whereof I am, whereof, no, 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 verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. According to the Bible, there was a mystery. There was something which was kept secret since the world began, which was hid from ages and from generations, but only in Paul's time, which would have been, you know, the beginning of the early church, was made manifest. I could quote many more scriptures, but I'll skip um, some of them and I'll quote one more. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 11, Jesus tells his disciples something very interesting. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And then he says in verse 17, 
For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And this is an eye-opener. Not even the prophets of the Old Testament knew this mystery, which was only revealed to the New Testament church, to Paul and those who lived at that time. You can name all the greats. You can name Moses. You can name Elijah. You can name Samuel. But there is something that we know or ought to know or should know today that they never had any knowledge about. And that is what we want to look at today. This mystery that has been made known for us today that even the greatest saints of the Old Testament did not know. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3 and we read through Ephesians chapter 3 to get an idea of what this this mystery is. Ephesians chapter 3, I'll begin in verse 1. Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand the knowledge, my knowledge, in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And in verse 6, we have what this mystery is. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And to some of you, you might be saying, what? That was the mystery kept secret since the world began? This is the mystery hid from ages and generations. This is what not even the prophets knew back in those times. That is not so great knowledge. That is not very enlightening. True? Doesn't sound like much. But one day, the thought struck me. I mean, the Gentiles and the Jews are made fellow heirs and of the same body. And that part about the body, it struck me. We're we are all made the same body. Let us look at a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 13. I want to just look at this, this part. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And when you have it, you could... Let me know. I don't know, raising up the hand. Amen. Something, right? Okay. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Sounds kind of similar to the verse we just read. The Gentiles being made one body with the Jews. But it says that by one spirit are we all baptized into this one body. Let us look at some other verses following the, this train of thought. For example, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16. 
It says. Oh. I didn't even know. It says, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And as I looked into the word of God more and more, I kept seeing this theme. That the Jews and the Gentiles were to be made one body in Christ by the Spirit, baptizing them into that one body. And this, it, it posed a great problem to my mind because, for one, it didn't seem, how should I put it? I, I just couldn't get it. I just couldn't comprehend it. What, how, how could we be um, baptized into a body? It, it doesn't seem real. It, it doesn't. It didn't make sense to me. So I myself would um, spiritualize away many of the verses of the Bible. I would say um, this can't. This can't be literal. I mean, I, I can't take this as it says. This must have some some hidden meaning. You know. You know. We we are baptized into one body and we are members of the body of Christ. That can't be for real. Well, let us look at some verses from the Bible. In John chapter 2. Verses 19 until 22. It, yeah. it says... Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou were it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believe the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. So Christ, referring to his body as the temple of the, you know, the of God, he said that this, his body would be crucified and resurrected. And I, I saw some verses in the Bible I just could not get around. For instance, um, Romans chapter six. Let's go up there first. Romans chapter six. Because remember, part of this mystery is that we are made one body with the Lord Jesus. And it says in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. And we know, we know this by heart. We know this. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we shall not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now try as I may, but those verses seem to be saying that Christ died on the cross so that we also might be crucified with him. All right. Did Christ die bodily? Was he crucified in the flesh? You can speak to me. So if I'm crucified with him, does, you know, am I put to, put to death with him in the flesh? Okay. When Christ was resurrected, did that involve his body? Okay. So if I'd be resurrected with him, would that also involve my, my body? Okay. And I started looking at the death and the resurrection of Jesus in a totally different way. If we are baptized into the body of Christ, 
if we are then made members of his body, then it will stand to reason that whatever happened to the body of Jesus happens to believers. You see, you see where the logic is going? So, so if Jesus' body was crucified, what happens to those who believe in Christ? They are crucified with him. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. And it got me looking into um, some things that I will share with you. I will share them with you. And I ask that we have an open mind. Romans chapter 6 and verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Jesus died unto sin once. And, and, and remember, follow my logic. Whatever happens to the body of Jesus, if believers are placed in the body of Christ, then when we receive the Spirit and it, it baptizes us into that body, then we, you know, we experience what he experienced in his body. How many times did Jesus die to sin? Sure. Did Jesus ever die to sin again? Alright. I'll still read it. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. I won't read all the verses, but there are plenty. There are plenty. I could quote about five right now. But in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. It says something very powerful. It says, well, we could choose any one, but I'll stick with verse 10. It says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus wants for all. I have a question. Does Jesus die daily? I mean, does Jesus, you know, every day wake up and he finds himself having to die to sin again? When, when Jesus died on the cross, when, when, he, when he experienced separation from God, that was once and for all. Will Jesus ever be separated from God again? Okay. Those who are crucified with Christ, are they crucified to sin once and for all? Well, if we are following the logical conclusion, then it would be yes. Are they now united with God, never ever to be separated again? Okay. Well, I grew up with the concept that, you know, one day you fight hard to get the victory over some sin in your life. You go to sleep, the next day you wake up, it springs back up out of nowhere. The, the same problem and then you got to die to it again. And, you know, we, we, we quote that verse out of context and, and I'll prove it. It makes no sense saying, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. You know, gradually overcoming. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me see if I could pick it up. If anyone has found it before me, you could tell me. I know it's in, hmm. Okay, in verse 29 to <clears throat> 31, I'm saying this is my understanding. It says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why should we stand in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If you read that in context... What the Apostle Paul is saying, when he says, I die daily, is that every day my life is in jeopardy. Every day my life is on the line. Any day I could be taken out for my testimony of the Lord Jesus. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, why am I here risking my life every single day? If the dead rise not at all, 
this this verse cannot be used to um, propagate the you know the belief that every day you have to try to be more dead than you were the day before. I mean, how many? <laughs> So, 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 I mean, what is it? Today, I, you know, I was dead to a certain level, but I, I wasn't dead enough. Um, so I need, you know, I need, I need to, no, come, come on. Let's be serious. Man, Jesus Christ died on that cross. He died unto sin once and for all. And if we by faith grab hold of that baptism, which places us into Christ, and, and, and we believe it. We also will die unto sin once and for all. And we would then, because it doesn't stop with this death, after he died unto sin, the scripture said that he, he was raised from the dead and now he liveth unto God. And we will live unto God for the rest of our lives. This led me into more things because the Bible has a lot to say about the death and resurrection of Jesus. I recognize also in my Bible that when Jesus died, the law had no more power over his life. The law only has power over a living person. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and verse... It'll begin at 4. And I mean, think about it, think about it. It says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is risen from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And I don't have time to go into all of it, but the basic idea is, when Jesus was born, was he born under the law? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, how long does the law have dominion over a man? For as long as he liveth. So, so when Jesus died, did it have any more dominion over him? So when he rose from the dead, did he rise still under the law? You know, you could basically put it this way. Was Jesus born a Jew? Did he live as a Jew? Did he die a Jew? When he rose from the dead, was he still a Jew? No, Jesus is not a Jew today. He, he, he died to his Jewness, made it a word, um, at the cross. And, you know, I, 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 you know, so if, if I'm baptized into his body and I experience what his body experienced, then I also, by the body of Christ, must be crucified to all Jewishness. I also have no obligation to the law. Okay? I mean, if the logical conclusion be what it is. And something else too. The Bible says in, I don't think I know the exact place, but... Okay, let me try Revelation. Revelation. I know one is in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. In fact, from verse 17 and 18. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first. And the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. There is a particular verse, I think it's in Romans, which says that when Jesus rose, when he rose from the dead, he rose never again to die. Then it would mean that those who, who are one with the body of Christ, they also have experienced his resurrection. And this might sound strange, they have died to death. Never to die anymore. Just as Jesus cannot now die. You know, it wasn't a resurrection like, say, 
Lazarus. He, he rose from the dead. But did he eventually die? So that was a mere resuscitation of life. But the resurrection Jesus experienced is such that he broke through the barrier of death. He can no longer experience it at all. Therefore, it will mean those who are in the body of Christ cannot die. Can't. You know, Christians don't die. You, you, you agree? It might sound strange. You might say, but I saw a Christian get buried just the other day. Christians don't die. In fact, Jesus said, they go to sleep. How come? Because they're resurrected with Christ. If you be resurrected and Jesus being resurrected can't die anymore, you can't die anymore. Something else which, um, and I mean, there are many things you could realize just by looking at um, the death, resurrection, and much more of Jesus, but I'll name one more, one more. In 1 Corinthians 15, I'll, I'll quote the question first, though. When Jesus came to this earth, did he have a natural body? Or did he have a, a supernatural body? He had a natural body. Okay. When Jesus went to that cross, did he have a body like ours? Okay. When he died on the cross, he had a body like ours. When he was in the grave, he had a body, you know, a natural body. Question. When Jesus rose from the grave, did he still have a body like ours? No. No. Where do we find that? I heard the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in, dis in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man Adam was made a living soul. The last man, uh, the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that which not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And this is where my investigations made me step back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, N no way. When Jesus rose from the grave, he rose with a spiritual body not limited to the restrictions of this earth true wait, if I be you, you know where this is going right wait, wait. if I am baptized into his body and I am a member of his body therefore I partake of the nature of that same said body that would make my body, spiritual, you know, beyond natural, not normal. Something would literally then have to enter in to my literal body. Hmm. And this, you know, where does this go? Where, 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 where does it follow on? Then I found out that Christ ascended up into heaven. I mean, you could just look at the Bible. It follows it all the way through. It says we were crucified with him, resurrected with him. It also says we ascended with Christ. There seems to be no stop to this oneness that we are to have and are given in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1. Well, actually, it's Ephesians chapter 2. But we have to come back to 1 to, to really... Um, get the point. In Ephesians chapter 2, just to, you know, to clarify, in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 to 6, 
But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ. Now I don't really know too much about sitting in heavenly places, but what I do know is chapter 1 says something which my mind can grasp. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Ephesians 1, 19. It says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? If we read it in context, Paul is really praying that the eyes of the people of God, in fact, let me read it in context. It's too, it's too important not to read it all in context. Verse 16. Verse 16. It says, or verse 15 rather. Wherefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. I know some of you have faith in the Lord Jesus. There is no doubt in my mind. I know some of you have love towards all the saints. There is no doubt in my mind. But Paul says after I heard of these things. I wanted you to have something else. He says... See, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Same word. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all so when Christ descended up into heaven he was placed above all principality and power which would mean the church his body would also have to be placed above all principality and power that includes Satan and his camp. I mean, Jesus has dominion over them. He can't tell them where to go. And how quick to get there. That power then must be in the church of Jesus Christ. It has to be. And you know, the, the similarities go on. It talks about how Jesus was made one with God. Then it will mean that we also were made one with God in Christ. Jesus was made a priest and a king. The Bible says we are priests and kings. The, the it, 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 it cannot be controverted. It cannot be ignored. The Bible is teaching that we literally become one body with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I'm going to read it to you from Ephesians 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, And verse 29. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29. To verse 32. The, the word of God says. For, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh. But nourisheth and cherisheth it. Even as the Lord the church. The same way I don't hate my own flesh. But I cherish and nourish my own flesh. The Lord the church. For this cause, sorry, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ. And the church. You know, I've come to the conclusion, or rather the conviction, because it's not concluded, because I believe I'm just scratching the surface, that 
the, the mystery, the mystery that was hid from ages and generations, the things that not even Moses or Elijah or Samuel or whoever you can name knew, the thing they never got insight into was this whole concept of you being one flesh with the Lord Jesus. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about us being one spirit with the Lord. And I always interpreted that to mean that, you know, well, I, I partake of the same um, nature of Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, just as he is loving, you know, so do I, you know, through his grace become loving too. Full stop. Not saying that's what the verse is saying, but that was the conception in my mind. But when this started coming home to me, I... I I had to change a lot of stuff I believed. Because this verse here is saying that we become one with Christ in every particular that that he went that he experienced through his body. I don't really know if that is um getting through, but I hope so. In other words, at the second coming of Jesus, Nobody in the New Testament will be resurrected. They were already resurrected. If I was to carry this principle all the way through, yeah, um, some of the Old Testament saints, they need to be resurrected at the coming of Jesus. But if we are resurrected with Christ, we cannot be now receiving the resurrection at Jesus' second coming. Now, I know there are verses that clearly say that there will be a resurrection of the righteous and of the the unrighteous, yes. But just as there's a difference between Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus' resurrection, there, will, there, there, there is, is a, a difference. There has to be a difference of the resurrection which we'll be experiencing at the second coming. Let me put it to you this way. Those who live until Jesus comes, will they be resurrected? They won't be resurrected? No. So only those who die get to be the lucky ones? <laughs> only they... <laughs> ah, uh, you mean the persons alive when Christ comes? Of course, every saint has to be resurrected. Every saint has to be crucified with Christ. Every saint has to ascend up with Jesus. Some receive it now in this New Testament time. Those who die before the New Testament, they might experience it um, at Jesus' second coming. But... Right. The, the, what do we call it in Adventism? No, the 144,000. That is it. The persons who are alive when Jesus comes, they, I mean, they have to have experienced the power of the resurrection. And it made me think, so what really occurs when Jesus comes the second time? And Colossians chapter 3 gave me a in Colossians chapter 3, it made me think, you know. I hope what I said was not um, <laughs> confusing, right? Colossians chapter 3. And this is, a, this is a very interesting passage, especially chapter 2. It talks about, you know, if, you, if you're dead with Christ, how, can, how could the um, law of Moses still be applying to you? If you're resurrected with him, you know... Jesus doesn't still keep the feasts. Jesus doesn't do these things. So if you're resurrected with him, you, you can't be doing these things either. If you are in his body. Um, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, it says, and I'll, I'll be reading to verse 4. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. You see the similarity, or I have to spell it out? I'll spell it out. When Christ appears in glory, you will also appear with him. When Christ died, you died. 
When Christ was risen from the dead, you are risen from the dead. When Christ descends up into glory, you also, when Christ was glorified, you are glorified in him. Christ is made a priest and a king, you are made a priest and a king. Christ is coming the second time. Well, you have to be coming the second time. It doesn't matter if your body was blown up and the ashes were scattered all throughout this planet. The mere fact Christ is appearing again bodily on this planet means you have to appear again bodily on this planet. Every person who's in Christ. And it, 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 it made me think, wait, if, if I follow, because I'm following this logical conclusion, if I follow this logical conclusion, if I'm following this where it goes, what does Christ come here to do? At the second coming. True. Mm-hmm. All right. I didn't, I'm not really hearing from up here. All right. Probably address that later. I didn't hear her. All right, but all right. Let me read it from the book of Jude, at least from the book of Jude. And you know, I've, I, um, we, we could discuss this because it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Not even the prophets in the Old Testament understood it. So, and we, and I'm persuaded, I'm persuaded um, that we don't really fully understand it ourselves. But it needs to be understood because it is for us to know in whom we have believed. In Jude verse 14 and verse 15. Jude verse 14 and verse 15. It says, And he not also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these same. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And one day, because, you know, I would like reading this verse a lot. Jude is one of my favorite books. Very sharp, to the point. My wife came to me one day and said, Jeremy... How can we always interpret the part about the Lord coming with his with ten thousands of his saints to mean the angels? Why can't that read? I mean, along with the angels, obviously Jesus comes with angels from heaven above. He comes with the angels. But why can't that also mean the Lord is coming with his church to execute judgment? Who judges this world? All right. Let me read um, First Corinthians chapter six. I don't. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter six. I'm going to read some verses, and you know, and I just want you to consider them. Just consider them. If we're the body of Christ, if we're one with Him in heart, in purpose, in mind, whatever He is experiencing, we will be experiencing. As well, it might seem like the blessing is too high and lofty, but it has to be so. When Christ appears the second time, we appear a second time. In that sense, persons are resurrected. Because the truth is, those who are living until Jesus comes, they will not be raised back from the dead. But the Apostle Paul says that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they will be changed. They experience something. They experience something. And, you know, they, something, their body changes until like Christ. He comes in glory. No, they appear in glory as well. But if Christ is coming to execute judgment upon the world, and, and you know, this doesn't have to be in any, um, especially from the sermon we had this morning, you know, our minds towards the, the character of God should be cleared. It, it, you know, when it says judgment, let us please not go down that line of, you know, thinking thunderbolts and God is angry and, you know, he, 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 he's... That's another um, discussion. But the point is, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, verse 2. 
Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are ye not worthy to judge the smallest matters? Verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And when I read this, you know, being the good, and, and you know, I don't want anyone to take this wrong, but I, I am, by the grace of God, a good Adventist. I said, this is the investigative judgment. That is what this is talking about. You see, the saints during the 1,000 years will, will go through the books of record, but the part about the angels had me. Why would the Lord ever call upon me a human being to, 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 to you know, co-judge with him an angel? Something about that just wasn't sinking right with me. I said, this verse, if we, if we take it as it reads, is speaking of the second coming. The church and Jesus co-judged the world. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Let's look at some verses. Revelation chapter 2, verse, verses 26 and 27. It says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule with them, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. Question. Does anyone know anywhere in the Bible where someone is spoken about who will rule the nations with the rod of iron? Christ. Where do we find it? No, 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 no. Mm, anyone? Psalms. Psalms chapter 2, correct. Psalms chapter 2. That, that entire phrase pertains to Jesus. I mean, you could flip your Bible to Revelation chapter 12. It talks of a man child who's caught up to heaven, and he will rule all nations with the rod of iron. But here we see the same words being applied to his church. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, you, you could go through the, um, the book of Revelation. The judgments of God in the book of Revelation come straight out of the sanctuary. I know our minds immediately go up to, you know, the galaxies above. But in the New Testament, the sanctuary is continually referred to as the church. The church. And in the book of Revelation, um, it, it seems as though um, when it comes to the final scenes of this world's history, that the church is up front and center in all the final events. They actually participate. It's not like we're going to be here and you know things are happening and we're victims to what is going on. The way it looks, I'm, I'm saying, I'm just saying the way it looks is like the church is actually the one who has the keys, who has the power. It, it seems as though the church is the one who's stopping the rain from falling. The church is the one who commands it to rain again. The church is the one who, 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 who is responsible. Or who has the power, rather, for all the, um, the occurrences that occur to the world. It almost seems as if Christ gives them the power like Moses. You know, when, Moses, when the Lord told Moses do something, he did it, things occurred. Saints judging the world. The church. Core judges. I know it sounds very strange, very new, but think about it. Think about it. The, the power is given unto us. Look at Revelation 18. We, we might not even read through it. Revelation 18. Only verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. A very familiar verse. Very familiar. And these are things which are in my mind, which I just wanted to share with you guys. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And how do we interpret that? We all admit, you know, or at least we say, this angel represents the body of Christ, the church, 
receiving power from on high to preach the gospel and the whole earth is, you know, they call it the latter rain. The whole earth is shaken up by this great revival of the power of God. But then, all of a sudden, when we jump to Revelation 20, I don't know, um, one of the learned people can help me. Is it called hermeneutics? The laws of interpretation of the Bible? Hermeneutics? But anyway, somehow, the laws of interpretation change. Or at least for me it did. Note Revelation chapter 20 verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. I'm, I'm just saying, if, if things are what, what it seems to be, that verse also must be speaking of the church of Jesus Christ. They, as members of the body of Christ, have a part in and participate in binding Satan, putting him in prison for a thousand years, and then they, as members of the body of Christ, participants in all that Christ does, lose him. It's power. That is some power. They, as members of the body of Christ, therefore participating in anything Christ does, along with Christ, execute judgment upon the earth. And it made me think, I mean, if the church, or at least what I perceive to be the church, was to seriously do like Moses, and raise its hands in the air, and pronounce judgment on all of them that be ungodly as Jews says, that would be like suicide. That will be like suicide. You know what I believe? I believe that coming on to the end of this world's history, we are in the end. That God has a great work for his people to do. I believe that much more than us preparing, you know, as persons put it, preparing for the judgment, we bring the judgment. And you can't judge somebody you have not warned. And you can't, you, can't, you can't execute anything unless you're in a position to do the execution. I, I really believe that God has a lot of power to give unto the church before some person says, that's, that's you know, um, biblical, that um, you know, the church has given power to heal alone. I'll quote some examples to you. There was this sorcerer by the name of, I believe is Alimas. And the deputy was starting to believe what um, I believe it was Paul was saying. The story is true. I might not have all the details. And Paul is persuading the deputy. And the sorcerer is getting in the way. And the Bible says Paul was full of the Holy Spirit. And turned to the sorcerer. And he said a few words. He said, I have to say a few words. I don't know it by heart. But when he, when he spoke it, the Bible says a, a mist came over his eyes and he was blinded. And the deputy said, Whoa, what is this new doctrine? And believed. I don't know what you call that, but that sounds like a prophetic judgment. Another example, you have Peter and a nice answer Sapphira. They come. No, I'm not saying that the, the, the individual Paul did it by himself or, or by his own will or anything. I'm saying that he participated with Jesus in this work. They came to um, Peter. They, you know, are telling lies about how much they really are holding back for themselves, making it appear unto all that they gave all, you know, to, to the church at that time. And Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, tells them, you're not lying to man. You're lying to God. And you know what? You're going to drop dead right now. Boom. That's New Testament. That is New Testament. Here we have the, the, the church of Jesus Christ even given the, the authority to prophesy prophetic judgments upon individuals. Now, in the book of Acts, that only happens on a small scale. 
only on a small scale. We only read about once or twice, probably could name one or two more. But it was mostly healing and casting out devils. You know what I, what I believe? That not only will the Lord restore the gifts of healing, casting out devils, tongues, for we have to go into all nations. And these things, but I think on a large scale, on a scale I've never seen before, the prophetic power of the Lord Jesus Christ to just speak. And nobody not taking you for a joke, you know, you know when you speak now, things begin to happen. I believe that will, will, is definitely what the book of Revelation is speaking about. I mean, that power will be invested in the church of Jesus Christ. And, and then it, you know, it, it goes on and on. You know, Jesus comes down from heaven above. We appear with him. He goes back to the Father. We go back with him. And, and here we have this, this uh, um, beautiful picture of the oneness of Jesus Christ and his church. Everything Jesus is doing, his church is doing with him. And it had a, a great impact upon myself. Um, I'm still, you know, looking at it. I, I no longer can take these verses and just throw them away. And there's much more. There, there, there are, there's much more. But in every aspect of Christ's work, the Church of Jesus Christ is a participant in and experiences that which he does. So, in exhortation. Those in here who claim to be Christian. You cannot be normal. Be normal. You cannot be natural. You cannot go along to the natural way of things. You know, the, you know, sin is natural. We heard this morning that by nature we were born the children of wrath. If you are risen with Christ, that cannot be true of you. It can't be. If you are risen with Christ, the, the limitations that are put on the average person because they have a natural body cannot be your limitations. I mean, in the book of Acts, Philip was speaking to a eunuch and somehow he was physically moved from one place of the planet to another place of the planet. That is not natural. You can't explain that. There's no, there's, no, there's no science available right now to prove such. That is totally breaking the laws of this planet. And you're not going to finish the work by keeping the laws of this land. <laughs> and you could take that how you <laughs> need to take it. If we keep, if, 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 if we keep abiding by th this natural way of things... We will not, I mean, we will not grow up into the fullness of the, of, of the stature of Jesus Christ. And we want to grow in the fullness of the stature of Christ. Um, here in ends this presentation. I pray to God that you were truly blessed. And may we now say a... Uh, a word of prayer.